excuse, excuse me, excuse me. I know. Let me let me say one minute. Hello. 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 Can everybody keep quiet a little bit? Uh, we have a uh, six speaker. We like to sit together. Is that possible? You can move a little bit so we can have a speaker all together here. Is possible? We have a six. So can you move to Obelia? Sorry about that. Yeah. Ask. Go ahead. Thank you very much. And uh, Fidishan? Fidishan? Here? Here. Oh, thank you very much. Wonderful. Wonderful. <laughs> but let's see Yes, it's mine. Oh, sorry about it. But, uh, Is it possible you can move there? Because we are speaker over here. Oh, no, yeah, sorry about that. Yeah, thank you very much. You sorry, you can. Girls, thank you. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, we need one, uh, two more, two more seat. Can you move, <laughs> move to the back, or you know we need two more seat. Object, you can move here. Here's one chair. Yep. And you can take that one. Jack, you can take this one. You can project over there, right? Uh, sorry for that, uh, because uh, we need to put all the file together and then we can start it. Yeah, I put it into a USB and then they can do it. Yeah, okay. That's okay, yeah. 
we, we can handle that. Go from this way or that way, it's fine. Okay, okay. Give me that, give me that list, then I can do it. Okay. Ten minutes. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have a connector. It's strange. Mm, actually, I can start. Let me start it. Okay, thank you very much for all your coming in to this uh, AI ethic. And this topic actually is uh, organized by many of the people. It's a surprise to me we have a uh, six speaker. And so basically the rundown will be, I will spend about three to five minutes to introduce each one. And then we'll give each speaker about eight minutes to talk. You know, I already have a good communication with my speaker. They promised me we'll be finished in the eight minutes. So after that, after the presentation, then we are going to about 10 minutes for the dialogue between the speaker the panelist. And following that, we have a 20 minutes uh, open to the floor and everybody can ask any question, okay? And of course, if you'd like to stay even later <laughs> and this room is available, then we can do that. Okay, first of all, let me introduce myself. Uh, I'm the Guo Wei, I live in the Taipei. And I actually, you know, is an ICANN board before, you know, for six years, and AP NIC board member for 12 years. And today we have a six speaker. Uh, the organizer actually is uh, Dr. Qin. He's uh, in the Xi'an Jiao Tong Limbomo uh, University. And another one is uh, Chen Chang Fang. Actually, he's from the Tsinghua University, Beijing, China. And Fili Xiang. Actually, is an uh, IT expert in the technical department in CNIL. I don't know what is the CNIL. Maybe you can explain for us. <laughs> and another one is uh, Ansgar. Actually, a senior research in the University of Nottingham. Uh, Jack Lucy is uh, actually the head of the AI policy in the Google AP region. And then uh, uh, Chen Yiqing, right? Uh, there is a uh, he is an AI company, he's a startup company in, the, in the Beijing. And another one is uh, Wang Shu, he's uh, from the Weibo. And also we have another uh, person is uh, on the back, is uh, doing the online moderator. Uh, can you raise your hand? <laughs> okay, that's good. Okay, now I think that's done. I can, I can. I'm not nervous. Okay, I'll take it out. Oh. I take the USB and so he can so make we, a presentation. The USB is okay, okay, that's good. Also, uh, Dr. Chen, you can start it. He, she is the organizer, and so keep your eight minutes, please. Okay, and can we move that uh, screen? Yes, a little bit. Just yeah, I minimize it. Can we minimize it, please? Okay, yes. So uh, first of all, so today is, I'm the organizer of the workshop and also, uh, so that's why I, I'm the first speaker because I would like to set a scene for the uh, workshop. So basically we want to, in this workshop, we want to discuss the uh, ethics uh, of AI from different uh, societies and from the different uh, sector, including uh, civil society, industry, and academia. So, uh, okay. So uh, first of all, I'd like to introduce myself. I'm Dr. Chin from the Xi'an Jiao Tong Liverpool University. And then my co-speaker is Professor Chen Chang from, from, uh, from Tsinghua University. Okay, 
Next slide, please. Next one. So first of all, we, I would like to discuss the general ethical issue of AI. I think uh, as many of you know that, you know, there's some uh, uh, general ethics uh, which concern the AI, such as human dignity, privacy, uh, employment, digital d divide, data protection, and the singularity, and also such as a driverless car. So those are the general ethical issue of AI. So I won't spend uh, too much time to on this issue because uh, we suppose our audience uh, are some uh, expert on these areas. Next, please. So uh, now I would like to talk about uh, the different uh, uh, AI research and the development in the world. Uh, first of all, I would like to talk about uh, uh, in different countries, for example, in US and Britain, for example, in the seat. So in the Europe, we, we, we look at the Europe, European development, they look at uh, actually uh, m most of them, uh, their development is about uh, like European unions look at the AI ethics. Okay, for example, in German, Germany look at the cloud computing. So if we look at the Chinese uh, policy on AI, mm -hmm. actually it's more about uh, like uh, manufacturing, inter intellectual, mm -hmm. uh, intelligent mm -hmm. agriculture and logistics. So the Chinese government actually put up some uh, one plus M project. Okay, one plus M means we uh, have a, a state funded social science plus the natural science foundation. They funded some project to support the development of AI technology in China. Uh, M means different type of the industry. Okay, we can look at uh, like uh, agriculture and uh, uh, health and uh, other, like a civil, uh, city management. Okay, can we have, next slide, please. So this is the uh, look at the policy and uh, re regulatory development of AI in China. So uh, the concrete policy start from 2014. Uh, we can look at the, from uh, 2014, there's a guidance on the uh, health development of Internet of Things. So start with the inter IoT, then we then move to the Internet Plus policy. Then they have an economical and a social development uh, five-year plan. So the crucial policies come at the t uh, 2017, uh, which uh, is called uh, the new generation in, uh, in AI development planning. So this is the crucial policy in terms of AI development. Okay, so the main point of the 2017 policy look at the formulation law and the regulation and ethical uh, norms to AI and the research of legal ethical issues related to AI and applications such as uh, surveys or robots. Okay, next please. So look at the, uh, the debate in China. So there's some ethical principle in the MAFA of regulation, of regulated AI. So the ethical principle proposed, I have to say that all this ethical principle is not proposed by the government, but it's proposed by civil societies, including the academias and the industry or, or NGOs. For example, the ethical principle, uh, including like a human centric and the justice, openness and transparency, information and consent, informed consent, and the responsibility, for example, who should take a responsibility for the, and the liability for the decision making by the algorithm. Okay, so they also propose some concrete methods to regulate the ethics of AI, for example, like a, a construction of moral agents. So these moral agents can act to promote the ethics of AI. Then, such as the ethical committee, you know, and the AI, uh, the, basically, the, we think AI ethics building up is not a one-off one process uh, thing. It has to be a process. It's a longer, gradual process. Okay, next slide, please. So, but also there's some speci uh, special aspect of China's AI uh, ethical issue. One of that uh, is uh, we have to take a cultural context into consideration. Okay, so the culture and the community is different in different cultures. So this may play a part in developing the ethics of AI, which is different uh, between the Chinese uh, ethics and the rest. Secondly, is that uh, in China, the research on AI ethics starts very late. So there's no systematical and comprehensive uh, 
approach right now. And, uh, and the other thing is that Chinese people lack of the deep understanding of ethical issues, such as privacy, you know, autonomies, or dignity, or these issues. And uh, now, uh, we have very strong um, development in applications, such as facial recognition, uh, language translation. Okay. So, but there, we are very weak in the ethical code and the regulations. Um, now, actually, the, the moment at the moment, the, more, the recent initiative is uh, it, from industry. The industry starts to do some initiative to try to uh, start to regulate, like uh, the application of AI in different uh, sectors. So, next, I will pass the time to my co-speaker. She will look at uh, the application of the AI in communication sectors. Okay, the Professor Chen from Tsinghua University. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, I just uh, uh, focus on the specific of the fake news detection by the AI. Uh, normally, we have the two model. Uh, one is the content model based algorithm. Another one is the social content based algorithm. Uh, these two models used uh, in Chinese uh, practice in uh, new media, and also, I think, uh, worldwide. And uh, uh, they have their uh, technology, their uh, target, their method. And uh, I just want to discuss about the problem of the ethics of these two models. Uh, ne next. Yeah. Uh, the first model is the content model based uh, uh, algorithm. Uh, it is an application of deception detection in computer science into news texts. So this model uh, could help us to uh, to recognize the, uh, the fake news, but uh, the transfer of this simple application scenario circumvents uh, number of special issues in journalism. The traditional deception detection issue adopts the interpersonal psychology of the definition of deception. And it believes that deception refers to conscious deception of the send of the information. And this, there's some risks of the, uh, this model. Uh, the practice of defining deception based on subjective intentions excludes false news caused by uh, negligence and self-deception. Uh, and I think uh, I haven't, no, haven't the time to explain this. But this model is really uh, has a risk of uh, ethics. And another model, next please, quickly. Yeah. This is based on social context uh, algorithm. Uh, there are some uh, the models, and uh, then the, they put in some uh, some materials, and uh, then classified into different news. One is fake news, one is real news. But uh, there's another uh, risks for the social context uh, model. Uh, this is on the, the slides. I'm sorry, I haven't, we haven't the time, but uh, uh, the last one, the, the, perhaps the, yeah, uh, we have some discussions uh, for the uh, algorithm models. Uh, I just uh, list on the slides. I'm sorry, we haven't the time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the next speaker will be Anger. Oh, no, sorry. Uh, yes, it's Anger. Um, and while the slides are being put up, so my name is Ansgar Kuhn. I'm a senior research fellow at the University of Nottingham. Um, but really, I think one of the main reasons for myself being on the panel today is because I also chair a, a standards working group the, at the IEEE, uh, developing a standard for algorithmic bias considerations. 
So I'm really mostly going to be talking about from the point of view of uh, standards organizations, uh, why do um, professional organizations like the IEEE um, have an important role in um, moving towards um, regulation in this space uh, or uh, helping with setting of ethics um, uh, approaches towards uh, tackling some of the ethics questions. Um, so next slide, please. So this is just to set the general uh, scene, why there's been so much um, interest to try to look at how to deal with ethics questions and uh, why there's a push towards the need for uh, introducing some kind of uh, regulatory response. It's basically this that we've had uh, almost at a, on a weekly basis uh, stories of something involving AI, algorithmic decision making or similar things going wrong. Um, stories about um, fake news, one of them, um, and algorithms taking down the wrong kind of content. Uh, stories about um, manipulation of um, the information that people are receiving through their news feeds and those kinds of things, uh, but also things like autonomous vehicles that um, malfunction and crash uh, with uh, fatal uh, consequences and many more. So next slide, please. So one of the things uh, that is an immediate kind of response that we see to these kinds of um, issues coming up in the media is um, in the political sphere um, that this triggers countless um, parliamentary inquiries. Uh, in the UK alone we've had um, by now I think eight parliamentary inquiries related one way or another to AI, algorithmic decision making, or other kinds of technologies that are basically in this space. Um, and frequently the outcome of these is, the, it seems that something needs to be done, but we don't know enough yet about how these technologies work, what the exact issues are, so therefore it is potentially too early to actually move forward with something specific to do, even though there is a strong sense that something needs to be done. We see something similar going on at the European Union level with the uh, European Commission having um, established a high-level expert group on artificial intelligence with the um, aim to develop um, clear ethical guidelines by the end of, is it this year or next year? Um, and the European Parliament uh, putting through um, uh, requests for assessment reports uh, and so forth. Uh, similar things in India uh, and Singapore, for instance, and man many other countries as well. Basically, we see um, many governments expressing the sense that uh, there needs to be some kind of regulation in this space, uh, but having uncertainty as to what to do. And part of that uncertainty has to do with the technical issue of this. It, it, we're talking about a new kind of technology uh, that is not well understood, especially not by um, the people who tend to be in this kind of policy-making space. Next slide, please. Um, one before. <laughs> So this is one of the areas where technical communities, such as the IEEE, but also the ACM and other technical communities as well, um, have a role to play. So in 2016, the IEEE launched a global initiative on ethics of autonomous intelligent systems. The idea behind this was basically to say, um, this is a space where there needs to be some clear advice on what are the actual uh, features of this technology, where are the um, concerns that arise. For instance, the frequent um, issue that gets raised about the, the opacity of the decision-making systems, that uh, deep learning, as an example of machine learning that's very popular, is not transparent as to how the decisions are reached. Um, is this truly the case, if you look at it from a technology perspective? Is this something that technologically can be addressed to a certain extent? Those are the kinds of questions that um, triggered the, the start of this initiative. So the, the IEEE 
Um, so the ACM came out with a list of uh, principles, which is a good um, initial stage. Uh, however, the IEEE um, considered that this is potentially not, doesn't go deep enough. A list of, of principles such as um, algorithmic decision making should be transparent. Um, there should be a possibility for redress. Yes, this is the principle that you want, but how do you actually do that? So the IEEE um, approached this from the point of view, on the one hand, of developing a document, uh, ethically aligned design, which is now uh, in its third and final version, it will be, um, which will be published at the end of this year, um, and it's freely available online, um, which goes into these issues in more depth. So basically, instead of 1A4 with principles, you get 300 pages, um, which you're not intended to read all of them, but you're supposed to focus in on the section that is relevant to your work. So there are separate sections on transparency, separate sections on particular application spaces, such as facial recognition, um, where it goes in into more detail as to what are the ethical issues there um, and what are the, the potential ways in which those can be approached. But another important aspect to it is uh, the development of standards, so industry standards. At the moment, the um, it, Global Initiative has 13 um, standards under development. I will not go through all of them here. So they, they cover things such as transparency of autonomous systems, data privacy, um, and the one that I'm chairing, algorithmic bias considerations, for instance. Um, next slide, please. Uh, so I will just uh, talk a little bit more about the P7003 standard for algorithmic bias considerations. Uh, so basically the idea behind this is to develop a clear framework around when you're developing a system, uh, what are the kinds of questions that you should be asking yourself, at which stages during the development process should you be asking these questions, such as is the data set that I'm using for either testing or validating the system or training the system, is it sufficiently representative of the population that will be affected by it? Um, those kinds of things. And it is being developed in a multi-stakeholder approach. Um, this, the IEEE standards process, certainly for these standards, is one that is um, every participant participates as an individual. They have an affiliation, but they do not have a different voice because of that affiliation. Everyone in these vote is equal. Uh, and our group is currently approximately um, uh, Forty percent uh, academics, thirty percent uh, industry, and thirty percent civil society. Uh, and I'll leave it at that for now. Thank you. Uh, the next one will be Wang Shu. Uh, can you bring the fire up? Bonjour tout le monde. Okay, I'm Jasper Wang from Weibo Corporation. And Weibo is the biggest social media in China now. So today I will share my viewpoint about internet rumors. Okay, everyone knows that the social media is a brand friendly change the world. In China, there are more than one billion active users on social media, which we call social media ecosystem. Like the Amazon rainforest, the social media uh, is uh, ecosystem also had many dangers. So I think the one pro major problem is the proliferation of the rumors and the fake news. The next. First of all, social media enable everyone to have the micro microphone to speak. According to the survey, 56% of the journalists said it's difficult to judge the truth of the news in the social media. Next. Secondly, the needs of the new customers shift from the fact preference to the interested preference that rumors and fake news are more popular at some point, while the truth may become less important. That's what we call post the true area. Third, improvement in the picture voice and the video production technologies had made it easy for people to wrap rumors 
through editing. The next. Okay. At the last, I show a picture to you, and this is come from oh, one, one before, please. Okay, this is a picture, and it's come from the very popular the news from the machine. So you know, I guess you already know where the laughing point is. The next. Whether in the East or the West, there is a proverb called the rumors and in the wise. But, uh, but I, uh, I think there for many countries and the uh, platforms have only evaluation mechanisms for the net network rumors, but without process. However, can we still fully believe that the rumors end in the wise? So in my opinion, the answer is definitely no. Uh, ensuring the truth of the information and the protecting user safety are the most the base ethics of the internet because the spread speed and the harmfulness of internet rumors are far greater than the rumors in the newspaper or television. They not only lead to public disappearance, but also lead to internet fraud, violence, even crime. Faced with the problem, next. All the country are actively exploring solutions. Last week, so at the Wuzhen Summit of the World Internet Conference, the CEO from PR Newswire suggested that fake news is a global issue and the truth is more important than journalism. Germany firstly to introduce, uh, introduced the social media management law on January this year. It created that the social network platform must clean the, cleaning the illegal contents reported by user within seven days. The next, let's talk about how Weibo performs. Next. As the largest social media platform in China, Weibo has more than 200 million active users every day and more than two million company and person receive revenue through the platform. This is a social media ecosystem totally. However, it cannot be denied that there are also many fake news and rumors on Weibo. So since 2010, Weibo officially launched the product for refuting rumors, create the office account. Next. Create the uh, office account. OK, this, yes, this page. Uh, create office account of the Weibo refuting rumors and the same topic on, uh, to connect the daily rumors and the publish them. The office account will push the inform uh, information of the refuting rumors to the most needed user based on their interest. At present, the reading volumes of the topic is close to 5 billion. Next. We should discover that it's so, in, uh, so simply to connect the information of refuting rumors is not enough. So since the 2012, we encourage Weibo users to report rumors information and publish it after the background review while provide reverse to the user who report successful. Of course, so all the rumors are re, uh, restricted to spared. Next. Since the 2017, Weibo launched the Lambo production, the Lambo production, uh, Lambo production, highly credible media. Oh, next, I'm sorry, is one before. Uh, okay, one before. One before sorry. Yes, one before. Okay, this is yes. We let the Lampo products, highly credible media and professional organization have the special right. If they found that one message on Weibo is a rumor, they can type a Lampo direct on it with deleted explanation. This message will not be deleted, but will be buried on the lamp of the rumor, you can see on the PPT. And it's become the nature man, uh, Mess journal for the refuting rumors. Next. Okay, and we find it's uh, effective the policy to manage user by credit system. So because someone's buried the rumors, they don't understand that. So we launched the user credit system in the 1920. For the rumors, for, for the people who spared the rumors and where to uh, 
detect detect their score. So, for example, when the score is detected below maybe 60 point, the, the people will be too restricted to read part of the content. So when the score is detected below 50 point, it will be restricted to speak. Next. Copyright protection is a good way to combat false information. So Weibo Cloud Edit is a video material trading platform created by Weibo. At present, it has more than 400 mini video copyright, uh, copyright material from more than 100. So Weibo, edit, uh, Weibo Cloud Edit support, uh, support copyright material of the institution and the safety media and uh, maintains the rights and uh, fair to false information. Next. So last month, I saw uh, an in, in, uh, interesting news that Facebook set up a female team to strike fake news and also see, uh, and, and thought that women will have more uh, advantage in this regard. After all, I, I don't know, it, it's true, because the proportion of the male and female employer is uh, balanced on Weibo. So we should also understand more than clearly that uh, the internet is an international platform that contains everyone. The spread of the network rumors and the damage we, they bring are also cross board So actually managing rumors and fake news on social media is a common responsibility for the, all the countries. So what I want to say is that a wise man in, as a wise man in the internet age, we should make rumors stop at the rational system, stop at the effective platform why end in our corporation? Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Okay, so the next one will be Christian. Any final part? Sorry, are you going to take questions at the end? Yeah, or? then all the speakers finish and then we are open the question. Okay. We have uh, 20 minutes for everyone. Okay. Don't worry about it. Yeah. <laughs> I keep the 20 minutes for floor to asking question. Okay, everyone. Uh, hi, I'm Felicien Vallée. I'm working at the CNIL, and I'm going to present the work uh, produced in this report that is uh, called How to Keep the Upper End and uh, Ethical Reflection by the CNIL on uh, Artificial Intelligence. Um, next slide, please. Um, F1, yeah. Just after, yeah, that's it. So, uh, in a couple of words, for, for those who don't know, the CNIL is the French Data Protection Authority. It's been created in 1978, and this is where I work. This is just across the street, actually. And, um, well, its mission is to, uh, to make sure that uh, uh, data privacy law is, uh, is effectively applied in France and for French citizens. And, um, as you may know, uh, since May uh, 2018, so last May, we now, uh, our reference uh, framework is uh, GDPR, so the General Data Protection Regulation, that is the common framework used all over Europe. So that's the, the, the main mission. But as a side mission, uh, CNIL got a, a new assignment by uh, the so-called Digital Republic Bill in 2016. And the idea is to, um, to lead a reflection on the, uh, ethical, uh, on the ethical issues raised by uh, new technologies. Uh, it seemed for the reasons previously exposed that actually uh, AI was a perfect fit for, this, uh, for, for, for the first iteration of this assignment. And so uh, what was decided in uh, January uh, 20, um, 2017 was to lead a wide uh, debate, a wide reflection um, in, in public, within the public. So uh, within about, a, in the span of a, about a year, uh, about 3,000 people uh, were uh, auditioned. Uh, about 60 events were uh, launched all over Europe, organized by universities, um, professional federations, administrations, companies, and so on. And on a wide vari variety of topics, uh, touching uh, justice, uh, security, education, culture, um, etc. The result was um, this, this report, 
published uh, at the end of uh, December uh, 2017, so a bit less than a, a year ago, and that you can find on the internet and also in uh, Knil's booth, uh, Knil's presentation booth just upstairs. So if you don't get one, please feel free to go. And um, I'm, I'm going to expose the, basically the idea so, uh, about it. And just more recently, I wanted to add that also these ideas were, uh, were also used in the ICDPPC resolutions. For those who are not familiar with privacy, it's the International uh, Conference on Data Privacy and protect, uh, Data Protection and Privacy Commissioners. And so it was, uh, it's the gathering of all data protection uh, authorities among the world. So they issued a, a resolution on uh, the ethics of AI a couple of weeks ago that uh, takes this, uh, this principle. Next slide, please. So, um, very quickly, because we're short on time, uh, in, in this report we identify uh, four main, four big families of, of concerns. The, the first one is uh, about, well, the fact that we, we built autonomous machines, and, uh, and these machines, they are actually a threat to free will and to uh, the, the, the idea of responsibility. So, the question is how to make sure humans keep, keep in charge and how to avoid what we call uh, so solutionism, so that's the term of uh, the thinker uh, Evgeny Morozov, so meaning that, well, to, to actually put too much trust into the, the systems, AI systems that are actually not perfect. A uh, second big concern that has been um, identified is the one about biases and uh, discrimination and exclusion. So the idea uh, behind, this, um, behind this concern is that, well, we, how can we detect uh, helpful uh, effects that are uh, encapsulated in an uh, AI algorithm, sometimes without the system designers, system developers uh, knowing about it. So how can we build frameworks reliable for, this, uh, for these matters? Um, and, um, well, basically, what we, what we say is AI are a very powerful tool, but they also, uh, as we can put it, encapsulated opinions uh, through learning data, through decision parameters, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, third concern we identified was the one about um, profiling and the fact that uh, we get more and more personal, personalized uh, services. And uh, we have to think about what it means in terms of uh, collectivity and community, meaning that, well, we are obviously more and more targeted uh, for whatever reasons. And the usual assumption is that an individual is actually the sum of uh, his or her data. And uh, obviously, with it seems that if we think this way, we, we lose something. So uh, we re risk things like uh, the bubble fi uh, filter bubble and things like that. And as an example, about 60 60 percent of millennials they use uh, social media to uh, to inform themselves so if we get only um, targeted information we, we, we might lose something as a society as a community uh, and lose cultural uh, pluralism and uh, last uh, last concern is about um, preventing massive uh, massive files uh, um, while enhancing AI, and it's more about, well, since we're a privacy uh, uh, data, data protection authority, about how to regulate the use of, uh, of data that AI needs a very vast amount. Uh, next slide, please. So I'm, I'm going to go fast. So which answers? Uh, and next one, please. So um, this, this report is more about a humanist uh, point of view. It's not really about uh, technical, uh, technical solutions. But w w what we found interesting, what we, we, could, uh, we could say we, had to, we have two really strong founding principles we, we thought could, should be respected. So the first one is about uh, is the principle of fairness, uh, meaning that, um, well, it's, it's for the, the systems we, we use and will use in the future. So the fact that they should be in the only interest of users, that they should be built only in, in, in this, uh, this interest and also for users in general, as citizens, as communities. And they should be transparent, accountable, and so on. And basically that means that they should, well, say what they do and also do what they say the, the proper way. Second founding principle we, we found was uh, the one about continued attention and vigilance, meaning that we as individuals must 
uh, especially fight against uh, excessive confidence we put into, uh, into this system and question regularly uh, how we get decisions and, and so on and still make room for uh, AI, uh, for um, human interventions in these, uh, in these systems. Then we have uh, several recommendations, uh, six of them I think we can go on, but I, I won't develop on this and we can talk about it uh, later on. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And uh, if you have uh, any question, please uh, try to list it and then when we open then we can start it. And the next speaker will be the Jack from the Google, please. Sure. Thank you very much to the organizers for inviting me. Uh, while we're getting the slides up, I just thought I would sort of start by opening, talking a little bit about why AI is so important to Google. It's something that we've been spending a lot of time thinking about from the ethical perspective. And the reason why we've been spending so much time doing that has been that AI has become very central to almost all the things that we do, uh, both from the product perspective. So AI is now built into most of our major products. And a lot of the improvements that we've seen in those products over time, you can even just, uh, if you want, skip to the third, to the third slide. I'll kind of go through these quickly to interest of time. Um, so just to give an example of that, you know, Google translates a product that we've had for a long time that used to be very bad, or maybe it's still bad in Professor Wu's estimations <laughs> we were discussing yesterday. But even if it's still bad, uh, can you skip to the third slide? Um, it's much better than it was before, and the reason for that is because we introduced uh, machine learning using neural nets, so neural machine translation, into Google Translate a few years ago. And so if you look, hopefully look on slide four. Oh, it's not working? Oh, okay. Um, Oh, I mean, it's, it's not a huge deal. I can, I can talk people through it so we don't waste too much time. Basically, what you would see if you were looking at slide four would be an example of a translation from a few years ago that was basically incomprehensible, um, a little bit laughable. And then after we introduced neural machine translation, that it's actually very difficult to distinguish between a machine learning-based translation from a human translation. And so that's just sort of illustrate that for us, we see it as being really, really central to our mission of trying to make all the world's uh, information universally accessible and useful. And we think we can do that much better using machine learning. But even going beyond a product perspective, if we were looking at slide five, you can sort of see a little bit of the image there. We also see AI as being a really, really powerful solution to solving a lot of really big problems at scale. So what you'd see on slides kind of five, six, and seven is that, to give one example, healthcare is an area where we see shortage of doctors being a huge barrier to expanding access to healthcare around the world. And one place where we saw that was in India, which has a shortage of about 130,000 eye doctors. And in India, the disease called diabetic retinopathy is the fastest growing cause of blindness. So basically, it's when you have diabetes that your retinas can, can degrade. And once this happens, the blindness is incurable. But if you catch it early on, it's actually a very, very treatable disease. Um, but the problem is, is, because of the lack of eye doctors, it was very, very difficult to do those early diagnoses. So many people were permanently blind. So we collaborated with a local research hospital in India and used machine learning as a way of basically just doing basic photos of people's eyes and being able to diagnose diabetic retinopathy at scale. And we've now recently, we're expanding that to other countries uh, around the region. So for us, we, we see the potential of this technology to be used for lots of really socially beneficial things. That's just one example among many. But at the same time, we also saw that there's a lot of risks and a lot of challenges with the technology, many of which have been identified already. Um, things bias and fairness were ones we were really concerned about. We recognized we weren't very diverse in terms of the people within our company who were developing the technology. We didn't have a good gender balance, for example. We didn't always have a good racial balance. So when you think about creating machine learning systems, how you choose which data sets to train machine learning models on is going to be affected by how diverse people are uh, who are designing those data sets, how they're labeled, what features people are looking at when they decide how they label those data sets. So we recognize that we had a, a huge risk of having problems with, with bias, for example. Um, another one was uh, how do you guarantee privacy uh, in ways when, even, th even when a data is anonymized, you can sometimes make inferences about particular groups based on the way machine learning systems are, are performed. Are performed so how do we make sure that we're building privacy into those, into those approaches? 
So we started out thinking about those problems early on, mostly through research, because that's kind of what Google does best, right? So we started publishing research into some of those problems. So two examples of those are, you, that you would see down here are on, on machine learning fairness. Because one of the things we realized we had to, to contend with was, what does fairness even mean when you're talking about bias? You know, should fairness be you're actually trying to um, guarantee equality for all groups, you know, going beyond what humans are already doing? Should we, machine learning be actually promoting something that doesn't exist in the way humans are currently interacting? Or should it just be reflecting in a neutral way the values that humans already have? Right? These are tough questions that there's not really any easy answer to, and philosophers are still debating them, so engineers are uh, even another level beyond that, right? So it's, it's a challenging thing. So we just started doing some research, partnering with lots of folks from different backgrounds to try to think through some of those problems. Uh, we also tr started developing tools that researchers could use to try to actually tackle these problems at a practical level. So to give one example of those, the slide that I would have had a slide 10 here is uh, <laughs> some tools that a team at Google, which we call the People Plus AI Research Initiative, which brings together researchers from all around the company who are looking at these issues, and they developed a tool called Facets, which is basically a way of visualizing your data sets that you use to train machine learning based on particular feature values. So what that enables you to do is to see are certain feature values overrepresented, are certain ones underrepresented, are there particular um, outliers, da uh, da data points that were mislabeled, things like that. And so when you're able to visualize them in ways that are very user friendly, it enables you to quickly identify problems that could be leading to bias uh, or, or fairness problems. So those are some of the t tools that we also were, were developing. So as you kind of see, we're gradually evolving our thinking a bit. We're doing research, we're creating tools. But we recognize that we're a really big company, and there's lots of diversity even within Google on how to approach these problems. So what we needed is not just sort of a lot of great people working on different dimensions of the problem, but we also really needed to have a shared ethical code that sort of outlined what, as a company, we stand for, and that would give us kind of a shared normative framework for, for analyzing potential problems and how we would address those. So what we did is about, I guess, three or four months ago, we launched the, the Google AI principles, which would have been at the bottom there. And those were basically outlining for us the things that we want to actively promote uh, with our, the use of our technology, and then also drawing some red lines of things that we would not support our technology being used for. And not only by us, but we also would not enable any third parties to use our technologies for these things. And that's things like uh, lethal weapons, things that can be used for mass surveillance that violates internet national norms, um, things like that. And so those are listed out there. Um, but I can, this would be one that would be kind of nice to show on the screen. Um, so you can see all of them. But I can yeah, read them out quickly here. So yeah, so the ones that we're trying to promote basically are socially beneficial. So we'll only proceed when we believe that the social benefits substantially outweigh potential risks. That's one. Two is around avoiding and creating, uh, or avoiding creating or reinforcing unfair bias, as we've discussed, being built and tested for safety, being accountable to people, which also builds in some notions around explainability and uh, intelligibility, and then uh, incorporating privacy design principles, scientific excellence, and then being made available for uses that accord with these principles. And that's really about making sure more people can use the technology, um, expanding it, and democratizing it. And then at the bottom, the, uh, the, the red lines are the weapons, surveillance, and anything that violates international law and human rights. So those are sort of the things that we now use when we do products, when we have new products, they go through review. We actually look at these principles as part of the product review process. We've built out mandatory ethical training that includes these for all of the, the folks in the company who are working on AI. We're, we have an advisory group now that we're starting to build that will include third-party advisors from uh, philosophy, from political science, from technology, who can help us to really think through how to operationalize those over time. And those are all very new things that we're just kind of rolling out, because this is kind of hot off the press stuff. We just announced it a few months ago. But that's sort of where we are right now with, with thinking through that, but we're collaborating very much with civil society and academia and that, so we, we, we certainly welcome views from, from those in the room and, and beyond. Happy to connect with you offline to hear feedback or, or things we should be thinking about as we're operationalizing those. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have a last speaker. Uh, Chen Yichin, please. Yep. So we just apologize.
apologize for the accident previous. Uh, the problem is the throttle script isn't enabled in the browser, so we cannot uh, load Lucas yeah, file. Sorry. No worries, yeah, because it wasn't made in PowerPoint. Probably this, right? This is an older system, yeah, sorry. Okay. <laughs> no worries. Okay, can Any we have time? the, yep? Yes, just a minute. Yes, so uh, I wanted to thank you all for your presentations. I had a question on uh, the score system for spreading grammars. Um, so I have two questions. The first is, had, how do you identify a rumor? And then what do you consider a rumor to be? Thank you. From over there, you just uh, pushed in and yeah. Thank you. Um, so this is, I guess, directed to the representatives of Google and Weibo. I'm curious if you are engaged with um, the P7000 IEEE standards um, and what your thoughts are on those and the ISO IEC uh, Joint Committee Number One um, Study Commission on Artificial Intelligence, if your companies have been involved in that venue on standards as well. Um, I guess broadly, it sounds like you're doing work internal, but what are your thoughts about spreading that work? across the ecosystem um, and the role of standards in that. Thank you. Any more questions? One more? No? Okay, go ahead. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Yu Chang Chen from The Fourth Paradigm, which is a startup in Beijing focused on AI technologies. Today, I'm going to introduce uh, to talk about how will AI serve human better in the future. For that, uh, we have to know that AI is not a transformer that can do everything we want. Uh, so we need to know w how AI works. Next, next, nice. So uh, basically, if you want to build an AI, you need four things. The first thing is data. Uh, it's the source of the technology. It's the source of their knowledges. Yeah, the AI is not based on the human experts. It's based on the data. So if you feed in the, what kind of data you feed in, and you get what kind of uh, intelligence. The next one is object. Um, the, the machine cannot understand as what as we human do. We cannot say a command to it and then they, they, they enforce it. No, they, they just understand those mathematics. So we have to translate it into an object, which is basically a mathematical function. And then we need features. Features is a... a Yes, the third thing is that we need a feature. Feature is a terminology in AI or machine learning, but uh, in the view of public publics, uh, you can understand features as the, as the viewpoint. We need, to, we need to solve a problem, and we need some viewpoints. From different viewpoints, the, the machine can analysis a problem. The first, the, the, the first one we need is the algorithm. Yes, it's the, it's the thing that most scientists put most of time on it, but it's the least thing that a public need to know. But the only thing that public need to know is that the algorithm is basically based on the statistics, which is a branch of mathematics. So what is statistics? Uh, simply saying that it is counts, and those big, uh, the, the, the majority wins, that, that's statistics. So this is the fundamental part of machine learning or uh, modern AI. So next slide. Uh, so there are three important things, uh, char character characteristics of AI. The first one is AI use historical data to predict the future. Uh, future. So uh, you can understand machine learning as a public experiment if you want to teach a dog uh, to sit. You, you, you tell it to sit and give some, uh, if it sits, you give some food and if it doesn't sit, uh, you give some punishment. And for AI system, it's some, some, to some extent similar. Yeah, if you want to have a good recommendation, you, you, have some, you have some activities and you get some rewards or response that uh, people like or do not like uh, accountant. So uh, machine learning is good at making repeated decisions 
that happened in the past and you use it to predict the futures. But, uh, futures. but if you want to, to predict the black swan events, the machine learning can't form the fundamental because they just based on the past data. The not, another characteristic of AI is that AI based on statistical machine learning. Uh, it's usually obey the, the majority rules in the data. So you often see the most, uh, what is the most common, most common things that are hidden in data. So this, this characteristics is possible to lead to the tyranny of, of majority problem. That's if you only, uh, the problem is that what kind of data you put in the system is matters most and how you, how you inspect the data is also matters. Another, uh, the, third is, the third thing is that AI technology do not make any value judgment. Uh, so those uh, value functions, uh, those objects are set by human, but not the machine itself. The machine do not know what is good and what was bad. Next slide. So uh, for, uh, to, to overcome those three, to, to, to use those three characteristics, how, how, we choose, how the AI can serve human better, uh, the, first thing, the first thing is that you protect, uh, protect privacy when using historical data. Um, we know that we want to blur data when using technology, uh, we want to blur data when you want to do machine learning, but blurring data can cause degrade of performance. So a branch of machine learning is called differential privacy that can preserve, can preserve the privacy of each one, but at the same time, well, remain a high level, high level of machine learning performance. Another one is to transfer knowledge in a more gentle way. Uh, we know that we need the other's data to help, help a machine learning system or AI system to build. You cannot only use your own data for AI intelligence system. You need, you need the person like you to build up your own system. So we need the data, but we do not want to leak the information or so privacy. So we need another way of transfer transferring knowledge from one to another, but not leak the privacy. Another one is to protect individual being overlooked by majority. Uh, there are two ways of doing that. The first way is to collect unbiased data and develop unbiased algorithms. Uh, the data is the most important thing, as previously said, most important thing in the uh, AI system. So we need to collect unbiased data or else uh, we are wrong from the origin. And uh, the next thing is that we, we cannot make judgment by superficial aspects. So hum, uh, human make judgments by, by, few, by few aspects because human can only, can only have the ability to read only three or four uh, aspects in a, in a time. If, uh, uh, if you read 10 or 1,000 rules or 1,000 aspects, you cannot make good decisions. So human always found the most important rules, such as Newton's laws. They have three laws. They had, they, Newton do not invent a thousand rules. So, uh, but for machine, machine can read many, many rules. Machine do not tell, tell. So uh, in machine learning, we need to put in more data and more aspects for it to analysis uh, in order to make the machine can, uh, can find the true reason but not those superficial aspects. Another one is, uh, another very important aspect of uh, AI is that we need a uh, more high diverse and high, uh, lower gene uh, algorithms. Uh, lo lots of AI system are, e uh, are ecosystem. For example, if you, are, if you are social media, you have those uh, publishers and those consumers who read news. So this is an ecosystem. We do not want to all the uh, readers to read one news Perhaps the, the total consumption is the same, but the, the, the social Wi-Fi, the, the, the Wi-Fi is not good. If only one person is produ producing, producing news, the gene is very high and we, we cannot make a long-term win-win. So uh, a, very important, a, a very important goal for AI is to obtain, for a, everyone can obtain AI service equally, not just those majority can obtain those AI services. Next slide. Next slide. Also, okay. Uh, so, uh, yeah. So, 
So the, the last thing is that we, we should prevent AI from doing evil, but AI itself can do not do this thing. We need a more, a more, regulation, a more regulation tools. AI is becoming more and more complicated. We know that in computer vision, uh, the algorithm is better than human in 2005 or 2006. Uh, uh, sorry, uh, 2015 or 2016. Uh, but uh, the parameters behind those algorithms is very large. It's, it's over one million or, or a trillion uh, features or parameters. So human cannot read those features and they do not know whether those rules or those models are good or bad. So we, do, we need to utilize AI to regulate AI. We need a more complicated models to regulate those models. Uh, and another thing very important is we need more regulations in collecting on ethical data. Uh, this, that, that is more, much more similar to the uh, medical area that we cannot uh, collect sort of data. So that, that's my point. Uh, we have uh, two questions. Is there anybody want to ask one more question so we can ask the speaker to respond to you? Go ahead, please. Um, yes, well, this question is sort of for the whole group. Um, it's nice to see a, a group that includes several uh, Chinese scholars and business people as well as international uh, representatives. I wonder if people know of any specific Chinese and international or just Chinese uh, industry initiatives to take on AI ethics. I know that there's some Chinese company representation in the IEEE process. Baidu has just joined Partnership on AI. But if there are more things that we should all be aware of, I'd love to hear about it. Thank you. OK, I think we have a three question. Any speaker want to respond? Any one of it? Yeah, oh. um, so, Jinx, go ahead. Yeah, so uh, your question is about uh, initiative from industry or from the different uh, sectors. I I'm fairly open-ended because just to say that um, there are a lot of pretty well uh, publicized international initiatives on ethics and governance of AI. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in the international sphere, what's going on in China's conversation is uh, important, but we don't know much about it. Okay, I, I think at the moment, as just uh, in, my, in my first bit, my, my presentation, as I said, you know, um, at the government level, the, the government is uh, trying to encourage, is actually is encouraged to establish the ethical code, but it's just uh, announced uh, uh, last year or the year before, so everything is in progress, and there's uh, no policy or ethical code. It has, it has been established in China, uh, but there's a debate uh, between uh, the industry and the academias, and also like a quasi governmental NGO. So, uh, as I said, this is in the middle of formation stage. But uh, we know some, as you just mentioned, like Beidou, uh, the other company, you know, also join some international initiatives. Uh, so, but this is a crucial stage because China is uh, in the middle of formal, formating uh, ethical code. So there's many proposals already from different uh, sectors. Yeah. Okay, I, anyone and want to answer? Anger? Okay, okay. I'll response to the question about the Weibo. And uh, this is a big question, so for saving our time, I just uh, to share my um, opinion is, actually there is no uh, the same standard to dis uh, distinguish the rumors and the fake news. But you know in the social media there are more and more the active user and actually this is uh, only just the small things or it's just the uh, little things where to change a boom in the very short time. So you know if uh, the platform to create a mechanisms to refuting the rumors, it will spend a lot of the money, spend a lot of time and employers. But actually, there's more and more people to, to call, call to uh, us to, you should do something to do it. Uh, just there, therefore, for the adult, it is more and just to do for our children. So uh, at last, I can share opinion about uh, from the International World Conference. And in the past years, when it's uh, big sales booms and all the journalists is were to ask each other and how could we can get more details. But nowadays, the journalists were to ask each other and is this true? Is this true? 
they were us. So I think it's the change. Thank you. Uh, we have now two speakers going to response, and then I will go to you. Anga first, and then Jack, please. Okay, so I wanted to briefly pick up on the question around the involvement of um, big c companies such as Google and Weibo in the standards activities. Um, I won't claim to have a complete overview of what what's going on in all of the P7000 series ones, uh, but I do know, for instance, that within P7003, which is um, the one that I'm leading, uh, we do have participants who are affiliated uh, with um, with Google and with other large tech companies. Um, they are affiliated with Google. They do not speak for Google. They do not represent Google's position as such, though we can assume that they will take some of like Google's principles on board if they are people from Google. Um, I think you will address that more. No, that's right. I was just going to say, yes, we are involved in those processes, um, as stated here. And both bringing in our thinking and what we're doing internally into those processes, but also then learning from what's coming out of those processes as well. So a lot of the conversations around ethically aligned design and all of that are things that are brought into our own internal conversations as well. So um, it goes both ways. And I think that's an optimal way for it to, to go moving forward. Okay, let's go to the another three question. Go ahead, one, two. Uh, go to the microphone, please. Thank you. Um, it's very interesting that we have presenters from China, but I'm kind of interested to learn about the very idea of a user rating system being downranked for not reporting truth. And it seems to be indicative of, of a larger social phenomena that is self-reporting and self-policing. And of course, it might be dreamy to ask this from China, but it's also that since the weakest aspect is the ethical aspect when it comes to the whole regulation of AI, but also the regulation of society, what do you think this would be the implications and how could it be mitigated even very faintly? Thank you. What about another two questions anybody want to ask? If not, I have a question for all of you. For all of you, you know, when we are talking about AI and the ethics, I think uh, there is a couple of things we have to take care. Of. Just uh, like a uh, change is uh, presented, the data. First of all, you correct the data is it legally or not. You know, because that is a very critical things. Uh, might be some of the country do not have a data production law, but I think uh, basically you EU already have a GDPR. You know, so that's the first thing, because uh, as, uh, as uh, the, the changes are presented, the AI start to the correcting the data. So this uh, correcting the data, access to the data is critical parts. That's one thing. The second one actually is just that you mentioned about the algorithm. You know, because the algorithm, just to take one example, maybe you see the news already. The Amazon developing the AI recruiting system, and it finally it doesn't work because they have a bias to the female, you know, and so they find that that is a bad decision, so they take it off. I think that is a uh, for the question. So go ahead. Do you any Chinese person you want to ask answer his uh, credit system, and maybe some of you you want to answer my question, please. So, uh, may I just clarify, do you mean the social credit system or the rating system for fake news? Fake news. So, I think both um, fit in the same paradigm. I think, if I'm wrong, let me know. Okay. Because in the Western news, you know, the general public, they have a lot of discussion about the uh, Chinese, uh, you know, using the credit system to evaluate who ha have a right to get on the bus to airline or something like that, get on the train. So he like to know, is this uh, fake news or how you work it out that system? You know, so is that, am I right or wrong? Or are you are asking a di different thing? I'm afraid that's well, not. you know the question, go yeah. ahead, okay. Yeah. So, so okay, we want to answer the two questions. That's a separate question. One is the social credit system, one is the rating for the fake news, is that right? Oh, the first one is the social uh, credit system. I think uh, at the moment the Chinese government is, uh, is trying to install that system uh, for several reasons, you know. Uh, 
basically uh, one is uh, I know there's uh, many news report uh, on this whether this is a kind of the control surveillance the social surveillance of the societies but I think uh, uh, we, we cannot uh, entirely deny uh, there's some consideration, but I think uh, on the other hand, you know, there are many general considerations about the safety issues and the credit card. One thing is about the credit system in China, you know, because people do not use credit card very widely. Uh, we have like uh, Alipay. You know, uh, this kind of thing, but the people do not use a credit card. So therefore, it's very difficult to, uh, to check your credibility. If you have credit card, there's a banking system, you know. But in China, the credit card is, uh, is not very popular. Uh, so, you, 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 so therefore, I think uh, the, the Chinese government may, may, may think, might think this uh, system to uh, really, you know, uh, check people's credibilities. Uh, so to push them to behave, for example, do not uh, escape the ticket, you know, do not behave uh, uncivilized in some uh, public space or do not uh, cheating, you know, like uh, 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 this kind of uh, consideration. So we cannot uh, entirely deny this is a kind of social surveillance, but there's some general consideration about uh, uh, credibility, you know. And the one thing, as I said, the credit, credit card system do not exist in China. So I do not know whether you want to say something about this. Yes, 20% uh, of the Chinese people have a credit card, and another 80% do not have a credit card. Uh, uh, and have the records, red color records. So for the rest of 80% of people, we have another ways of um, check if it is, uh, if, the, uh, if the credit is good or not. Uh, as just said, we have Alipay, uh, which is an online purchasing uh, system that is widely used in China. Uh, about 50% or more Chinese use Alipay. And from the use of the Online purchases and online 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 credit uh, credit logs, they can to some extent know uh, whether one's credit is good or not. But for this is for financial system, and for a wider wider aspects, I don't think China now have a, a, a social well credit system. Okay, okay. About the social media is the um, credit system. I can give you an example, and because we are talking about the Alipay, is just uh, create a social media and create a system. And if you just uh, to apply for some visa, maybe the Singapore the visa, and if you the score on the social media credit system is uh, more than the maybe uh, 700 score. And you can get some of the, uh, it's very simple, simple things that just about to get to the Singapore visa. It's credible, it's uh, available, okay. Sure. I just uh, want to add some uh, more information about the social credit uh, system. Uh, we do have the social credit system. Uh, perhaps it's not perfect. Uh, but this social um, credit system mostly to the industries, uh, not to personal. So uh, that's the question. Um, I was actually going to pick up on the previous question as well, um, because I, I, I completely agree with concerns around this uh, issue, which I think wasn't quite being uh, addressed in the questions so much around if somebody's going to get downrated because of spreading of rumors, how do we actually define what a rumor is? How is it credible that the person who ended up spreading the rumor could have known that this was a rumor or not a kind of rumor? So are you going to get downgraded because you simply didn't have the ability to check the validity of this. These are definite concerns, and there's the more general concern of um, the cooling, the, 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 the fear of saying something because maybe you didn't have enough, you weren't able to check it enough, and there's a chance that perhaps it will get listed as a rumor, and what kind of a consequence can this have on you? So, so the way in which that implicates um, people's sense of being able to express themselves. Um, and I would just like to add to this that this is not purely 
um, I think, an issue with, with Chinese services such as Weibo, but we see this on um, Western social media services as well, as they've been um, pressured to act on fake news, whatever exactly that means. Um, they're experimenting with these methods of flagging up this could be fake news, but also of trying to down rank the visibility of content based on whether or not people s indicated this as being fake news. And so then you get into social dynamics. So some person posted something, maybe a group of other people don't like their posts and they will indicate it as they think it's fake news and then it gets down rated. So this is a big problem, I would say, because AI, from, from a technical perspective, AI is not up to scratch to identify this as real news or not real news. There is not a sufficient data set. For a new item that comes up, what is the reference data set to indicate whether this was true or not? How is the AI supposed to do this? And as long as AI doesn't actually understand language, it does statistics on language, it compares, it can do translation by comparing this bit of text to other kinds of text and statistically it's probably like this, but it doesn't actually understand the content. So how is it supposed to identify what is true or not? So yes, this is definitely uh, Please uh, prepare, we have only last turn to ask in the question. So, you know, uh, is there any speaker want to make a comment or we go to the last turn? Yeah, I just want to pick up uh, Asaka's point. Actually, if you look at oh, the... Keep short. Yeah, if, so you if you look time. at the Facebook, Facebook is using what you oh, just, 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 just mentioned. Uh, they, they, they give the news, like a news feed, the credibility, you know, uh, to display the credibility of the news source so people can say whether this is credible or not credible. So I don't know whether Google has that kind of measures. Because in Facebook, they have these measures to expose the credibility of the source of news. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, so we don't have the ability to, for users to, to indicate whether something is fake news or not, and then it'd be up or down ranked based on that, the way our algorithm works, that is not used as a signal. What we do have is we have a fact check tag that publishers can use to fact check stories and then use that to then link. And so then you can see that on search results um, and then link, but it doesn't actually have an effect on the, the, the original stories ranking on search, so the algorithm doesn't use those user signals, um, so we don't use that approach at, at Google. And of course, uh, uh, wait a minute. Uh, please raise your hand if you want to speak the last turn. Okay, please go ahead. Yeah. Uh, one. Just I think uh, both uh, Google and uh, Facebook use the third part uh, to do the check fact uh, system. Fact so, check tags, yeah. Yeah. So uh, I don't know. Is your company uh, has the technology to detect, or just to use the third part? Yeah, just just the third party. So we haven't been able to find a way of using AI to detect fake news. Um, basically, for the reasons that Ansgar mentioned, that AI is not very good at very context sensitive inquiries. And so, what is, let's say, the exact same piece of information if it's captured in a news report that's actually debunking that particular myth versus it's being used in a way of supporting that myth? AI is not very good at, at, use, at, at assessing that kind of context. So we haven't found a way of being able to do that. That's something that I think there's a lot of interest. In, but we haven't found that to be reliable. Even identifying things like hate speech, AI is not very good yet, which is in some ways a little easier actually than fake news. And even there, we're not all the way, we're not good. We're getting better at things like terrorist content. That's easier. It's one level. Hate speech is a little harder than that. And I think fake news is even harder than that. So, okay. Uh, raise your question. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, can users have access to the criteria? of the process of rating in China. Uh, do you have some accountability uh, policies? Thank you. And another one, go ahead. Yes, so um, if the government is using a private company algorithm, and, uh, an AI system, and they want to uh, sort of uh, pull together the algorithm and look at it to explain the decisions that has been made if, it, if the AI is used for, 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 um, for government decisions. Uh, how do you handle the IP, uh, okay. IP situation? Okay. 
a couple of MPs over here. <laughs> okay, anybody want to answer her question okay. or his question? Go ahead. Okay, I answer the first question. And of course, we published all standards and rules for the uh, credit, yes, yes, this, this system and to the, all the public. And every month, we will to publish some more details about and in this in this mouse and how many people just to do be uh, get the low score and uh, how many people to get the high score we were to more details on the web and it's the it's it's published for everyone so you can and and we have um, just some the customer service to answer the question so if you have some uh, some question and why we just get the the low uh, credit uh, credit score, and you can on, uh, uh, you can ask the customer service, and they will answer this question. And every day we have just uh, maybe just a two thousand cost service to 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 pay for that. Yes. One question. So as a the uh, Data Protection Authority. And, uh, so I, I believe the uh, question is about uh, AI being used uh, for uh, go governmental use and uh, delegated to uh, uh, a, a private company. So um, how to open the box? Well, I, I believe this is a necessity to actually uh, make sure contractually that you can do that, particularly if you deal with uh, sensitive matters and you will need to actually explain if you've got a user or a citizen that asks you why this decision was taken for me, etc., and so on. So I believe this is obviously uh, something that has to be done. But I think it can also, it can be, uh, this problem, this issue can be raised by a contract with the company that actually provides the software and uh, accepts or not the terms the government wants to do. Otherwise, they have to develop it uh, by themselves, which is also done, for instance, sometimes in France for several matters. Okay, thank you very much. I think uh, our time is up. First of all, I thank all the speaker, make a, you know, keep the time you know, on time. And second of all, I really thank you for all the uh, audience. Uh, you are very cooperative and <laughs> really has a lot of very good questions. So let's, uh, you know, oppose. Uh, thank you all the speaker here and also for the audience. So I think uh, this uh, meeting is adjourned. Thank you very much.